Welcome to Lockdown Conservation Science. I'm David Mills and I can be contacted at the email address on screen. Today's video will be on the topic of atoms and elements and the clip art on the title screen today is from vectreasy.com. Atoms exist, everything is made of atoms. The ancient Greeks decided or theorised that everything was probably made of atoms. If civilization fell apart tomorrow, as long as this information was preserved, probably we'd be able to get back to some form of modern civilization fairly, fairly quickly. There's some interesting theories and papers published on this idea. If we go back into antiquity, the ancient Greeks had a pretty good idea atoms existed. They thought if you took something and kept cutting bits off, eventually you'd get to something indivisible, something that the sharpest knife could not cut, an atomos. And uh, Democritus wrote this, uh, this poem, by convention bitter, by convention sweet, but in reality atoms and void. It probably scans better in the ancient Greek, but it really is a pretty good understanding of what there is. There's atoms and there's the space between atoms. There's not really anything else. After the ancient Greeks, the next thousand years or so is filled with people really doing alchemy. They're trying to turn base metals into gold to make diamonds more sparkly and shiny and discover the elixir of life. They fail. They don't succeed. But in the process, they pretty much invent the rudiments of chemistry and they perform lots of dodgy experiments with urine. As far as these people are concerned, the, the world is made of four elements, earth, air, fire and water. And by combining these four, you can make everything around you. This is effectively the case up until about 18, 1789 when Lavasseur publishes this book, The Elementary Treatise of Chemistry, and it basically lays the foundation for modern chemistry. In it, he defines an element as a single substance, which cannot be broken down any further, and says that all chemical compounds are made from chemical elements. He does away with the idea that there's only four elements, no longer is it only earth, air, fire and water, but many more. It also contains the first published chemical formula, which is that great must equals carbolic acid plus alcohol. So he's basically saying if you're making wine, what you have in there is a mixture of carbolic acid and alcohol. If you get rid of the carbolic acid, you're left with the alcohol, he made wine. In the modern era, we, we have some interesting dates on the screen. Um, Basically, more and more chemical elements are discovered, and then in 1869, Mendeleev arranges these elements into seven groups, and basically invents the periodic table. In 1897, Thompson discovers the electron, and realises that, well, this seems to be smaller than the atom, and seems to actually be coming from the atom, so there must be something inside the atom, so the atom might not be indivisible any longer. Uh, a year later, Curie discovers that some elements actually fall apart naturally on their own and really comes up with the idea of radioactivity, so elements must be made of something smaller. And then in 1911, Rutherford discovers that there's actually something very small and solid at the centre of the atom. He discovers the nucleus of the atom. And then we skip on a few more years. And in 1942, the first nuclear reactor, the Chicago Pile, is started up. And now we've actually realised the dream of alchemy. We can turn one element into another. We turn uranium into other elements. So this is the cartoon atom. This is the lies to children model of the atom. It's got most of the right features, but it's almost entirely correct. But it kind of works. It's, it's good enough to get the general idea across. What you have is a nucleus surrounded by electrons. Well, for conservation, we're mostly interested in the chemistry of the atoms. This is basically what's going on with the electrons. The electrons do chemistry. But for completeness, we'll also have a, a quick peek at the nucleus of the atom. So we can see from the diagram, we've got electrons and in the nucleus. 
Um, we have positively charged protons. There are also some particles called neutrons, which are like a proton, but are neutral. The nucleus is in the middle, the electrons whiz around on the outside. Another thing that's correct with a cartoon version of the atom is that the number of electrons equals the number of protons in the nucleus. And it's the number of protons in the nucleus that make an element and actually tell you what an element is. So lithium, for example, has three protons, carbon has six protons, hydrogen has one proton. Atoms are neutral, so the number of positively charged protons in the centre is equal to the number of negatively charged electrons on the outside. Another example, oxygen, eight protons, eight electrons, eight neutrons. Iron, 26 protons, 26 electrons, but 30 neutrons. The number of neutrons is not necessarily the same as the number of protons or electrons. Some elements have different forms or different isotopes. This is basically the same number of protons, but a slightly different number of neutrons in the nucleus. Quite often, these elements are radioactive. There'll be one form with a particular number of protons and neutrons which is stable or more stable and there'll be other forms where with more or fewer neutrons the atom is radioactive. We do occasionally use this in conservation science for probing what things are made of but that's a, a topic for another video. Why do we use the cartoon atom? We use the cartoon atom because this is currently the best model of the hydrogen atom, the Schrodinger equation on screen now. This is not friendly, this is not easy to get into, this is why we use the lice to children model of the atom. So we know atoms are probably fairly small, so let's get an idea for how big an atom is. So the honest answer is, it's about 100 picometers, so 10 to the minus 12th of a meter. And if you're not entirely familiar with this form of numbers, I will do a separate video on this, uh, but that's to come on a little bit later. The smallest atom is helium, it's about 32 picometers. Cesium is the largest at about 225 picometers. These are numbers, this is not entirely easy to visualize, so hopefully the next couple of slides will, will give an idea. So a human head weighs about five kilograms. That's around 2.5 to the 26 times 10 to the 26 atoms. That's rather a lot of zeros. Not only is that a lot of zeros, it's also a big number, 250 septillion. It's a vast number. This is already not necessarily easy to understand. But let's make it a bit different. If we expand each atom in a human head to the size of a grape, how big would the head be? Well, it would be a little bit bigger than our planet. So the takeaway from this is atoms are absolutely tiny. This is a, a periodic table. Well, don't worry about this, we'll come back to this later. But it shows the relative size of atoms across the periodic table. So we can see in general, atoms on the bottom left are larger. And as you go across the table, atoms get smaller. And right up in the top right, we have a helium, which is the smallest atom of all. So all atoms are small, some are smaller than others. This is all very interesting, but can we actually see atoms, and why would we want to see atoms? Well, we can use a technique called field ion microscopy. In this image, every, every dot in the image is an atom. So this is a, a very sharp platinum needle, which has been imaged using a particular microscopic technique. You can see that atoms form into patterns, they form crystals as in the metal of a needle. And if you're looking at conservation of metal items, understanding the crystal structure of metals can be quite interesting. So this, this all comes from the arrangement of the atoms inside. And in fact the arrangement of the atoms inside really controls how materials behave, even if you're not looking at metals, polymers, onwards. It's all based on what the atoms are doing. You can use another technique called atomic force microscopy where you can actually see atoms on a surface. 
You can even move atoms around using a similar technique called scanning tunneling microscopy. The image on screen now is actually um, a fake where it says if you can read this you're too close but some of the dots in the background are real. You could actually move atoms around and write things. The video here, which I can't play for copyright reasons but which I will link in the description of this video, actually shows what you can do if you've got a lot of time on your hands, a scanning tunneling microscope and you want to move atoms around. In this video we take a deep dive into the world of atoms. So each white square is one tenth the size of the preceding one. So at first we're zooming in on the hand. So the square now is about 10 centimeters on a side. We're zooming into the skin. We're now on about one centimeter per side on the square. As we zoom in further, we're now one millimeter per side on the square. We can see the structure of the skin. Going in deeper, tenth of a millimetre per side. And as we go through the skin, we start to see some of the structure. We see some of the fine capillaries beneath the skin. And as we go in even closer, we actually see a white blood cell. And as we zoom inside the white blood cell, we start to see the structure inside. And we see the DNA inside the blood cell. Zooming in on the coiled DNA, we start to see more of the structure of the actual molecules. And as we go in further, we actually zoom in on an atom, an atom itself, and down towards the nucleus, and basically to the limits of our knowledge. So at this point everything is a bit jittery, and this is due to quantum effects and uncertainty. But at this point we're, we're looking at inside the atom. So we're zooming in, this is the outer electron shell of the atom. As we go in a bit further, we'll zoom in towards the nucleus. So we can already get the idea, the nucleus inside the centre of the atom is very tiny compared to the atom itself. We're going in a long way before we come to the nucleus. And here we are now, we're looking at the nucleus of this particular atom. Protons and neutrons whizzing around. And as we go in, this is it. This is the limit of our knowledge. So if you think atoms are small, components of atoms are even smaller. The best guess for the sizes we have are currently on screen now, but it, it, it's not really overly important, especially for conservation. This is just to give you an idea of what's there. So the takeaway really is atoms are tiny. They're composed of three parts. The protons tell you what type of atom you've got, which elements you have. The neutrons basically hang around and sometimes cause problems. They cause radioactivity. The electrons, for our purposes, do the day-to-day -day work of forming bonds and do the chemistry of which we're familiar. So at this point you might be thinking to yourself, well okay, if I've got a heavy element, uh, a metal perhaps, with lots of protons, it needs lots of electrons. How do they all fit in? Well, congratulations, you found one of the lies in the lies to children model of the atom. We need to reduce the level of lying in the model a bit. So we need to look at the concept of shells. Not this kind of shells, but electron shells. So electrons like to pair up where possible, and they also just form layers or shells around the nucleus. So the first shell has two electrons. So hydrogen, the first atom with one proton, has one electron. In its shell, it has a single electron. Helium is the next atom in the periodic table, has two protons in its nucleus. It has two electrons to balance. 
to become a neutral atom, its shell, its first shell, contains two electrons. This is this is called a field shell. The second shell around atoms can, can contain up to eight electrons. The third shell can contain another eight. Beyond the fourth shell and higher, things get complicated. We may come back to those later. If you look at the concept of shells, so not only can shells take the number of electrons that they really want, they want to be filled with that number of electrons. A shell that doesn't contain as many electrons as it could is called a partially filled or an unfilled shell. These type of shells are reactive. Um, what that means is they, they want to form bonds or they want to mix with other atoms. In conservation, reactive elements are generally frowned upon. They're going to cause degradation, perhaps. As an example, hydrogen, very flammable gas, has only one electron in its outer shell to balance a single proton in the nucleus. Whereas helium is very unreactive, it's got a full shell, two electrons. Many atoms have full shells but are happy to lose electrons, and we'll see this when we come on to look at the periodic table. Generally, what's going on in the shells can give you an, an indication of how reactive things are going to be. So, in general, an atom with one electron in its outer shell will try to lose it. It will want to give that electron away and form some sort of bond. An atom that needs to gain one electron to fill its outer shell will also be very reactive. It will want to form a bond with something that it can grab an electron from. And atoms with full outer shells are not very reactive. So, do shells exist? That's actually a pretty deep question. They don't exist as I've drawn them. Electrons are not really hard points whizzing around. They're more of a diffuse cloud. Basically, it's quantum. It goes back to that equation, the Schrodinger equation for the, the atom. We'll cover the existence a bit more in a later video. Now might be a good time to pause the video and go make a cup of tea. The next section will be about the periodic table and how it puts everything so far covered into a tabular form. So this is the periodic table. This is a modern periodic table. It shows all of the elements we know and they're grouped together according to their properties. I won't go into the history of the periodic table, but there's a very good article on Wikipedia which discusses how it was formulated, where it originally came from, and I'll put a link in the video. The position of the elements on the table tells you several things about the element and also tells you something about its behaviour. Vertical columns on the periodic table are called a group or a family. In general, as you go down a group, the elements become more reactive. So hydrogen is a fairly reactive gas. Lithium is a, a fairly non-reactive metal. It will fizz a bit if you put it in water. But compared to other things as you go down that particular group, it's pretty inert. Potassium or rubidium, very reactive. You never come across these in conservation. If we go across to the next column, we have beryllium, magnesium, calcium. Magnesium and calcium you may use in conservation. Um, especially in paper conservation, you may use them as soluble salts in water to buffer things when you're doing particular treatments. But in general, as elements become more reactive, they're more likely to want to combine with other atoms, and sometimes in ways that we as conservators don't want. The other grouping on the periodic table is, are the horizontal rows. This is called a period. The general trend as you move from left to right across a period is atoms get smaller and a bit more reactive, but the general trend is outside of the basic scope we need for this video. For completeness, I'll also mention that there are concepts called blocks on the periodic table, grouping the elements according to them being metals, non-metals or semi-metals. We we'll, won't cover these at this stage, but we may come back to this. The main block on the periodic table is the one that's in yellow in this particular video. 
this is the transition elements. So the way the electrons behave in these is quite complicated. We probably won't cover that. But the transition elements are the metals that we tend to use. Iron, copper, nickel, cobalt, silver, gold, platinum. The general metals we're familiar with. Um, some of these are used in conservation, either as pigments or in other ways. But we'll come back to those at another stage. The periodic table, as well as showing the elements that are known to exist, really shows what's happening with their electrons. We have hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium and francium. They all have a single electron in their outer shell. This is why they're quite reactive. They want to give away that single electron. They don't like having a single electron. The second column, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, radium, have two electrons in their outer shell. They're quite happy to lose those. They really want to have electrons, but they're, they're happy to lose those two electrons. So they're fairly reactive materials. Other groups have more electrons that can either be gained or lost to form bonds. Again, we'll come back to that as we need to in later videos. We'll finish off this video with just a quick mention of valence electrons. So the valence electrons are the electrons in the outer shell. They're the out electrons that are available to f for chemical reactions, to form bonds. So in this case, we have lithium. It's a soft, rea fairly reactive metal. We're considering lithium in this video just because it's the simplest case, not because it has a particular conservation use. It only has three electrons total, two in an inner shell, and its next shell has a single electron. This is the valence electron. If lithium can lose this valence electron, the outer shell vanishes, the next shell down becomes the outer shell. It has two electrons in. It's a filled shell. Lithium atom would be happy to lose its outer electron. Basically, this is the process of forming bonds and how molecules are built from atoms by giving or accepting electrons in outer shells. We'll look at this in the next video on chemical bonds. Takeaway point from this video. Takeaway points from this video. Atoms exist. Atoms are made of smaller parts, electrons, protons and neutrons. The periodic table tells you about the electrons in the atoms. Good periodic tables will also tell you the number of protons in an atom, the weight of atoms and things. And we'll use this when we look at dilutions in another video. The electrons in an atom exist as a series of shells around the nucleus and the behaviour of these electrons determine how atoms react and form bonds. That's the end of this video. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any comments or suggestions, please email me, leave them in the comments below or find me on Twitter. The next video will be looking at forming bonds and molecules.